This is Public Voice. I'm Scott Festrick. I'm here with Roger Martin. Roger, I found your book, uh, The Opposable Mind, shocking in that I've had a brain <laughs> for 40 years, and it turns out I've been using it all wrong. Um, <laughs> that's, very, that's very sad, Scott. <laughs> I know. Could you, could you, for my benefit and for those watching, could you explain what you mean by integrative thinking? Sure. Uh, what, uh, what I went out and looked at is, is how highly successful leaders think, and what I found is that the most common characteristic that set them apart from others is an ability to, when faced with opposing ideas, to rather than thinking that their job is, I have to figure out which is the best or which is the least worst of these, let's say, two ideas, opposing ideas, rather their instinct is to say, no, I'm not going to choose, I'm going to create a better answer than either of the two that takes into account and uses aspects of the two but creates a better answer. And that's, and that's integrative thinking, and I saw it over and over again in these highly successful uh, people. So conventional thinking is confronted with either cut jobs or cut expenses. Yeah. They'll choose one or the other. Yep. An integrative thinker will come up with a different solution. Can yeah, you give me an say, example of what they might do? Just say, well, uh, it would be like, um, you know, Izzy Sharp, Four Seasons, fantastic uh, Canadian built for, uh, Four Seasons. He said he was facing two models. His first model was his first hot uh, hotel, which was a roadside motel on Jarvis Street, actually, uh, the Four Seasons Good Motor Inn. Yep, uh, 125 rooms. Uh, he loved it because it had warmth and intimacy of a small place, but it didn't have all the amenities a business traveler would want, conference facilities, blah, 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 all that, that stuff. His third hotel was the Four Seasons Sheridan, which is now the Sheridan across from uh, City Hall in Toronto, 1600 room. It was the classic other model, big city center hotel with all the amenities, but it was, it was very cold and impersonal. Everybody would have told him, and did tell him at the time, Izzy, you have to choose between that, that small motel or the big city center, center hotel model. Those are the two models, and you can't do both, right? You gotta choose one or the other. And I would argue that if you would have chosen one or the other, we wouldn't be talking about Izzy Sharp because there would be nothing special. And instead he said, no, I'm going to create a new model, which ended up being a medium-sized uh, uh, hotel with a, with a quality and level of service that is so distinctive and so fantastic that it will enable you to, y to do a smaller size, have all the amenities, pay for all the amenities, but with the smaller size, maintain this sense of intimacy and comfort. And that's the Four Seasons model. They're all smaller than, than the rules of the business say you need to be to afford all the amenities. Right. But I don't know about you, Scott, if in the last time you were in a Four Seasons, did you <laughs> see a shortage of all the amenities you'd want in a hotel? No, nope, Last time being so. never, I thought it was a <laughs> great example of a place to stay. Uh, is this, from your experience, is this type of thinking something that can be cultivated or is it something you're born with? I think it's something that can be cultivated, uh, but isn't, uh, is the problem. I think people are taught that their job is to choose, right? Think of how many CEOs you might have talked to about saying, saying well, the buck stops here, I have to make the tough choices, right. right? The integrative thinkers do not make tough choices. They sort of reject the notion that that's their job. So I think we teach people to make choices. We teach people uh, to try and believe that there's one true model. Like how, I mean, think about, think about your elementary school education. Right? How many times were you taught this is the rule, this is the model, this is the, this is the American Revolution, and these guys were good and these guys <laughs> were bad, right? As opposed to, there's one model that says this, there's another model that says that, kind of your job is to hold those models in your mind and try and come up with a better interpretation of it. You know, no, things are taught as the truth, as, as reality. And, and unfortunately, nothing we know is is uh, reality, right? No, the best thing we can do, the best thing we can do is stare at the world around us and try and interpret it as, as best we can. But we teach people that they can see reality and that causes them not to use their opposable mind so they don't develop it. Is that something then that if you were to try to teach it, is it something you try to teach in a business school or is it something you teach through mentorship where somebody who's capable at this tries to pass on that skill to somebody up and coming through an organization? Well, I think, I think you can teach it by mentorship. I think you can teach it in, in, in business schools. Interestingly enough, I mean, there are a bunch of people now who've read the book, bless them, and they say, Roger, isn't it a tad late to teach this in a graduate school of business? And so there is now a, one of the 
large U.S. states that has come up and visited and said, we'd like you to transform our K through 12 education to be more opposable mind oriented. And I think we're going to we're going to work on it. Uh, is that a model I think that's been right. built or is it something you have to construct yourself? Now? Something we'll have to construct. I've, I've been worried more about pedagogy for graduate business students right. than uh, elementary school students. But we're now doing we're now doing at a, a school here in Toronto, a pilot uh, uh, teaching uh, grade 10 students uh, to be integrative thinkers. If you're running an organization, is there a way to either attract or identify these kinds of thinkers? I think there's a way to attract them. Um, I, I would say I don't have the answer yet on how you can identify them. Uh, but I think you can attract them by having a culture that is a culture of, of uh, seeing opposing models as a wonderful thing, uh, a treat, something that will enable you to get better answers than converging quickly on this is the one and only uh, true model. More and more these days, uh, children are being pushed towards a very specialized type of learning and uh, pushed towards a niche. Does that affect their way of thinking and make them more conventional, do you think? I, I don't think it necessarily has to, but I think there's a real danger that it, that it will. Uh, and what I worry about specialists and specialization is uh, peop when people specialize, they often learn a language system, a set of models that are, that are uh, customized for that specialty. And it enables them to more easily in their mind reject somebody else who doesn't use that language system or those models, right? So, so if, you're, if, you're, if you're a lawyer, you use legal language. And when somebody else uses non-legal language or non-legal uh, logic with you, it's easy to say, well, that's just wrong instead of saying, saying to yourself, well, that, now that's an interesting other perspective. How could I take the best of that uh, perspective and integrate it uh, uh, with mine? So it, it kind of depends. Are you becoming a specialist with the idea of winning arguments and, and excluding other sites of thought? Or are you becoming a specialist so that you can help other people with your specialized knowledge to come up with, come up with sort of better solutions and answers.